How can it be? What uh, Cherie just read for us describes how things are going to end up. God takes over. Uh, we reign with Him and go on into eternity. The problem is we still have several chapters of this book left to go through. So how can this be the end? Well, it's the end in the sense that we have been talking about how the book of Revelation is a series of cycles. And each cycle takes us from beginning to end. Uh, it uses different language, different imagery. Uh, sometimes shows us something from a different perspective. But we are approaching the end now of our second major cycle. And God is going to wrap up all of history. You, you will remember we begin our, our first cycle with the six, se six seals. And there are seven seals, but the, remember when we got to ch the sixth seal, there was an interlude. And what happened in that interlude is God explained what was going on. So we go through these first seals and at the end of the sixth seal, which just coincidentally happens to, 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 to end in, with these words, who can stand? Remember, because it describes the wrath of God coming upon the world. It ends with a question, who can stand in the face of all this? So God says, essentially, okay, wait a minute, time out. I'm going to take a moment between the sixth and the seventh seal and explain to you who can stand. And he, he goes in then and uh, in chapter 7 and he tells us how he's going to preserve the church and so on and so forth. Then uh, we pick it up again in chapter 8 and we begin the second major cycle which is the seven trumpets. Okay? Well we've gone through six of the trumpets and what do we have? When, when the, the sixth trumpet is over it says, whoa, and there is no repentance. So what can happen? Well, God again says, okay, wait a minute. We're going to take a little time out here, and I'm going to explain to you uh, what, what's going to happen. And so we begin with, with where we are now, chapters 10 and 11, where God is explaining what's going to happen and how he's going to preserve his church. What we've seen in these cycles is what we see in history. If you're, you're a student of history and you, you study it, it doesn't matter where you want to start. You can start in the Garden of Eden. You can start with wherever you want. But if you study history, you see it's a series of cycles. And these cycles are, are rather predictable. And in the spiritual world, the cycles go like this. Opposition to the church, miraculous intervention, the church is preserved. Now that's good news for us, you see, because we, we oftentimes get in this book of Revelation we think, well, how, what does it have to do with me? It's all going to happen sometime down in the future. No. It's great news for us because when we suffer opposition for our faith, when we suffer persecution for our faith, we can know that God is going to preserve us. He is going to take care of us. This is good news for the seven churches. Remember, this is written to them, and they're going through persecution and opposition. And so they need to hear that God is going to preserve them in the face of all of this opposition and problems. Now last week, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, we saw that the church's mission during this time is to tell people about Jesus Christ, right? It's to be a witness to Jesus Christ. And that's our mission. That's what we're here for. That's what we're uh, supposed to be doing. But we also noted earlier in our series, and this theme goes all the way through, that if you indeed are a follower of Jesus Christ, you will become a witness to Jesus Christ. And if you become a witness to Jesus Christ, in one form or another, you are going to become a martyr for Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of or you're a witness to, you're going to become a martyr for. Now, we live in the United States. We're very fortunate. We're very blessed. Uh, we, uh, we think about facing opposition. It amounts to maybe people making fun of us or something. It's, it's not a big deal. But indeed, that could change. We don't know. We don't know. There could come a time when, uh, as it is in, in many countries, and, and we see it on the television all the time now, where people are killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. That could happen here. Uh, I, I hope not. I'm not predicting it will. But it, in one way or another, 
if we are a follower and a witness, we will experience some form of martyrdom. So let's look now and see how God's going to preserve his church. We, we saw the mission of the church. Now we're going to see how he preserves the church. And I want to read for you uh, chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. And when they had finished their testimony, that's the church, right? The two witnesses that we talked about last week that represent the church. When they had finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. That symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Well, this doesn't look very good. The two prophets have just been killed. The church is laying dead in the streets. I thought I said that Jesus was going to preserve the church, that God was going to take care of the church. But here the church is laying dead in the streets. Those that dwell on the earth, which is just a term for those that are not God's people, are rejoicing, they're having a good time because there's no longer this witness to Jesus Christ in the world. It looks to them like the church is finished. But things are not always as they seem, are they? Especially when we're dealing with uh, the spiritual world, when we're dealing with things of our God. And that's why Paul told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. So here we are, we, we see the, the witness to Jesus Christ slain, dead, lying in the streets. That's what we see with our eyes. But what do we know in our hearts? We know that God said his church would prevail. So we're, that's the assumption we're going to go on. Even though it oftentimes looks like the church has failed. Now if you look back in history, at the end of the first century, Rome had won. How many of the apostles were alive? None. They had killed every single one of them, with the exception of John, who died of natural causes, but they were all dead. It certainly looked like Rome had won. Rome had managed to stomp out the church. Ah, but what happened? In the next two, three hundred years, the church flourished and grew immensely. So what looked like wasn't what really was. So the church flourished, the church grew, and the church rocks on for about 1,400 years. And we come, come to the, the end of the 15th century. And again, if you look by sight, it looks like the church has died. Do you realize that in the 15th century, now, now the church was there physically, but it, its heart, its spiritual heart had been cut out of it. In the 15th century, in all of England, there was not to be found a single literate priest. The church had degenerated, had lost its way. For all intents and purposes, it looked like the church was dead. But what happened? The Reformation, right? The beginning of the 16th century, 1517 is the day we usually mark it by. God raises up a guy named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther uh, advances the Reformation. And the cry of the Reformation becomes ad fontes, back to the scriptures, back to the originals, is what they mean. And they, they said the church has lost its way and we're going to go back to the original writings of scripture and rebuild the church. And that's exactly what they did. And they, they came up with this thing, they, 
that we know and they knew as the five solas and uh, we talk about them here sometimes and this is you know the reformers uh, said that that is the foundation of the church you know scripture only grace alone faith alone Christ alone to God alone be glory the five soul is the Reformation. That's what we seek to do here at Parkside Church, is to be true to those five issues. Another 600 years have passed. And what do we see when we look at the church today? Doesn't look very powerful, does it? We look around in society and we bemoan the fact that all of our Christian values are sort of trampled on and uh, governments push the church out in every, just about every area you can think of. And uh, it looks to me like the church is, if, if not dead, it's at best impotent. But guess what? That's what it looks like. But I will guarantee you, if Christ does not return, the church will cycle and become strong and vigorous once again. Just like it always has. In the 19th century, we didn't get to where we are overnight, by the way. The, the big slide the second time around started in the 19th century uh, with, in Germany with the German philosophers. And their, their cry, you remember the cry of the Reformation, Reformation was ad fontes, back to the originals. The cry of the 19th century German philosophers was Gott et est, which means God is dead. Now, many of them, you'll know their names, Hegel, Nitschke, Marx, God is dead was their cry. Now, what do all three of those guys have in common? Come on, louder, Skyler. They're all dead. They're all dead. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? All of the God is dead people are dead, and God's rocking right along. His church is still here. It may not be all we would hope it to be. It may not be as powerful and influential as we would like it to be, but it's still here. And it will be here 2,000 years from now if God chooses to tarry that long. I was reading a book the other day and it, it's talking about the, what they call the neo-atheists, the new atheists, the folks that are picking up the baton, Hegel and those guys. And they have a group of them, and they call them the, the, the four horsemen of the neo-atheist movement. The names are some of them you'll know. Dan Dennett, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins. Now these guys there are writing books and, and things about how God, we don't need God, God is irrelevant, God is dead, blah, 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 blah. And you know what they'll have in common a hundred years from now? They'll all be dead. And I guarantee you the church will be rocking right along. Again, it may not be all we hope, it may not be all we want it to be, but it'll still be going along. Now how in the world can I say that? I mean, these guys all have multiple doctorates. They know more than I do. I have trouble adding two and two and coming up with five. But, you know, these guys are much smarter than I'll ever be. I can say that based on one thing. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Either Jesus is right, or these guys are right. Now, who are you going to throw your lot in with? I'm going to go with Jesus. Here in chapter 11, it looks like Jesus was wrong. But, we walk by faith, not by sight. The two prophets lie dead in the street. Where is their power? Where is their fire? Remember they had this fire coming out of their mouths that devoured folks that, that uh, came against them and tried to persecute them? Where is all that? 
and the people who dwell on the earth are rejoicing. How is that right? Maybe Jesus is wrong. I don't think so. Let's move on. Let me read for you verses 11 through 14. But, there's that big word in Scripture. We often see it, don't we? Just when things look the darkest, here's that three-letter word. Jumps out at us. But, after the three and a half days, God always limits the time, a breath of life from God entered men, entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. We have here the preservation of the church. It looks like it's dead. It's lying in the street. But a breath of life is breathed into them. Ah, where have we seen this before? Some 500 years earlier, you remember Zechariah? What did the angel promise to Zechariah? How would the church conquer? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Ah, oh, the breath of the spirit. There you go. There you go. Verse 11, the church is not dead. It is filled with God's spirit. And it rises up and accomplishes what he would have it to accomplish. And how does it do it? Not by might, not by power. See, the church was never, never intended by God to be politically powerful. The only times it has ever really been politically powerful was when it lost its way. In the 15th century, the church was spiritually impotent, but it was politically very powerful. That's not what we want. Now, I'm not saying we should drop out and not be involved. We should, because the book of Romans is plain. We need to be good citizens and, and take care of our civic duties. But the church will never conquer by voting in the right people. It will never conquer by amassing a large sum of money. It will only conquer by God's Spirit, which works in mysterious ways. But now we see another thing. We see a picture of the last judgment in verses 12 through 14. And an interesting thing here. God takes the church, he gathers her up, and he's going to protect her. Kind of reminds us of scripture where it talks about he gathers his people under his wings, you know. That's what he's talking about here. He protects them, he gathers them. But look what we see here too. We see that 7,000 people were killed. And again, a symbolic number. That's seven for a, a, a toll. And were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, doesn't that seem a little incongruent? They're terrified, but they give glory to the God of heaven. These are not God's people. These are people that dwell on the earth. These are the people that made fun of the people of God. These are the people that danced in the streets while the two prophets were laying there. Now they've gone from gleeful to terrified and yet now they're giving glory to God. Why would they do that? How could that be? Ah, does that not remind us of something the Apostle Paul uh, wrote in Philippians about chapter 2 verse 10? That at the name of Jesus, there's going to come a day when at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, not just God's people, but every knee will bow and every tongue will confess of those who are in heaven, of those who are on the earth, of those who are under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
every knee will bow. Either out of fear and terror or out of joy and love. But they will bow. The problem is for the people that dwell on the earth, when they bow their knee, it's too late. It's over. For the people of God, it's the beginning. It's a glorious future. Aha! Uh -huh. And that's what we see next. We see the thing consummated here. We see the promise realized here. Verses 15 through 19. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We gave thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came in the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen with in the temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Wow. That's quite a scene, isn't it? Finally, the question raised in chapter 6 by those who had been killed for being Christians is answered. Do you remember the question? Do you remember the questioners? Chapter 6. Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? There's that phrase again, those earth dwellers. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. And now the time has come. Now the time has come. They said, how long? And you'll notice God is, all, is so consistent on this thing when we question him and ask him two, the two questions, we always get the same answer. When we ask him how long and when we ask him why, what's the answer? It isn't. He never tells us. He's consistent in that. And I think that's a good thing. And so it is with these martyrs. He says, you just wait. And when my plan is completely unfolded, then I will take care of it. And now that time has come. The long-promised kingdom of God is now consummated. What was begun in Matthew chapter 3 is now completed here in Revelation chapter 11. And what happened in Matthew chapter 3? John the Baptist, verse 2, he, what does he say? The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God was begun with Jesus' first coming. The kingdom of God will be consummated with his second coming. It, and he's ruling and reigning now. It's not like he's, he's waiting, but his plan is unfolding and he is superintending it right down to the finest detail. You will remember early on, I, I shared with you uh, one way to think about this. Uh, that came out of Germany, a guy by the name of Oskar Kuhlmann, and he calls it the D-Day analogy. You remember we talked about that, the D-Day analogy? Everybody knew that in June of 1944, the Germans were done. Anybody that really knew what was going on could have told you that. But when did the war end? May of 1945. What was begun June 6, 1944 was finished in May of 1945. But when June happened, it was a foregone conclusion of what was going to happen in May. 
And so it is when Jesus came. Now you can quibble about the exact time. That, that the scholars, you know, we, they like to quibble about things. So, so one guy will say, well, the kingdom of God began with Christ's baptism. Another one will say, well, no, the kingdom of God began with Christ's crucifixion. Well, no, it began with his re resurrection. Uh, you pick any of them, whatever you like. Uh, R.C. Sproul, one of my favorite guys, he says it began with the Last Supper when Jesus said, this is my body given for you. You can take your pick. The point is, it began with Jesus Christ. It will be consummated or fulfilled with Jesus Christ. That's the point. And isn't that always the point in, the, in Scripture? Jesus Christ. It's like, like when you're a little kid in Sunday school. If you don't know the answer, just say Jesus, because it's always the answer. Yeah. And that's the whole point of Scripture, is Jesus. Another way to look at it, uh, I think this guy's a German, don't know for sure. Anyway, his name is Gerhardus Voss, and he was an early 20th century um, theologian, and he coined this term called the already not yet. And that's the tension, he says, that we Christians live in. We live with the fact that Christ's kingdom is already here, but Christ's kingdom in all its fullness is not yet. But it is a guaranteed deal. So we live in this already not yet thing. And sometimes it's a bit disconcerting for us. But remember, when you get a little disconcerted, you walk by faith, not by sight. And you'll be okay. Um, now here's something very interesting in verse 17. How do we know that this is the consummation of all things? How do we know that this isn't symbolic of something else? Well, the answer is in verse 17. Let me read it for you and see if you can pick it up. Saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. It's a little nuancey thing for you here, but God's name is now changed. He has never been called by this description before. Notice, they give glory to God who was and who is. How is that usually said? Who was and who is and is to come. Oh. Oh. And we see it in two other places in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 verse 8 where Jesus himself is speaking and describes himself as the one who was, who is, and is to come. We see it again in Revelation 4, verse 8, where the four living creatures are speaking, and they say to God who was and is and is to come. Now here, it's the four living creatures again speaking, but what do they say? The God who was and is. He has come here in chapter 11. His kingdom is consummated. That's pretty cool. And that's the end we have to look forward to. He is no longer coming. He has come. What a great day this will be. Or will it? I don't know. Only you know. Only you can determine whether this will be a great and glorious day. Or whether this will be the worst day of your existence. You see, Christ's coming is a two-sided coin because he's coming to give his love and his mercy to his people. He's coming with judgment and justice for those who dwell on the earth. One group's going to be deliriously joyful. The other group is going to be terribly frightened. If it were today, what would it be like for you? Would it be a glorious day of rejoicing to see your king? To receive in fullness the grace and the love and the mercy that he's shown us and we only realize in part now? To be able to 
know him as he knows us, as Scripture says, to be able to truly love one another as he has loved us. Oh, glorious day. I think there's a song in there, Steve, about that. What a glorious day that will be. But for those who dwell upon the earth, for those who have rejected Jesus Christ, it will not be a glorious day. Look at our final verse. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within this temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, earthquake, and heavy hail. We don't have time to go through all of those things, but I want to point out to us, what do we see in his temple? We see the ark. The ark of the covenant. And what did the ark always symbolize? God's presence with his people. It symbolized his grace and his mercy, but it also symbolized his great wrath. And when the Israelites, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, would take the ark with them into battle, their opponents were terrified because they knew that as long as the Israelites had the ark, God was with them and they would persevere. They would prevail. And when they lost the ark, it was bad for them, was it not? And so the ark being present is both good and bad. It just depends on who you are, on where you stand with Jesus Christ. Every human being who ever lived will recognize him. Every knee will bow. It's just what the question is, just whether it will bow in fear and trembling or in great rejoicing. Only you can know. And if you don't, now is the time. Because we don't know. God may tarry another 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 years. I don't know. But he may come before this day is over. The point is, there's a limited time. And the only time we have for sure is now. So I would encourage you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now is the time to make sure you do. We're going to pray in a minute. You can simply, in, in, in your heart, ask Him to be your Lord and Savior and then begin to act on that because immediately it takes place. And then you can look forward to this day with great anticipation. What a wonderful thing that would be. Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are not only the author but the guarantor of our faith. You have sealed us with your Holy Spirit. You have promised that when we die, if we die waiting for you, that we will immediately go into your presence, that we will be with you forever in eternity. And Lord, eternity is to sound trite a long time. And Lord, for those that don't know you, it's going to be a terrible time. And none of us wish that on anybody. So Lord, I would pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would take this, this time to bow their knee spiritually to you and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I want you as my Lord and Savior and know that their future is eternally sealed. And for those of us who do know you, Lord, help us to draw nearer to you, to come to know you better, to truly be your people, your representatives here on this earth, to be inviting others to come to know you, to come to Parkside Church, Lord, to hear about you, and that we all might grow together in your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.